Salendra Draconi, A Novel Perspective of the Psychology of Warfare. Episode 1, The Anacron Campaign. Chapter 3, Knights. The finely dressed lords and ladies sat on long benches on either side of equally long wooden tables, their wide eyes seemingly as large as the empty plates on the tables in front of them. Beyond those plates lay the desiccated ruins of what had been just a few hours before piles upon piles of food. Now, all that remained of their Thursday feast was a few scraps, bones, half-eaten bread rolls, and the large and edible food pits. This was more food than any of them had seen in at least three months, and would be the most food that they would eat until Uncle's passing the official end of the year. As they sat at the table, happy and content with their bellies as heavy and taut as cannonballs, they murmured amongst themselves that the service announced that dessert trays were forthcoming. Many of them wished that animals known as dogs assisted in their world, as it would give them excuse to request items known as doggy bags. Alas, they had no such luck. The king sat in a high-backed wooden chair at the rear of the room. His dark purple and white robe swayed as he stood to his feet and tapped the side of a glass goblet. His numerous guests stopped their respective side conversations, turned their attention to the king, and tried their darndest to sit up straight and listen to what his majesty had to say. The king welcomed his lords and ladies to the third and final Thursday feast of the year, particularly noting three young people who were attending the feast for the first time. He then wished them all a happy year-end celebration, as surely most of them would be observing uncle's passing in their own various provinces. There was a fourth fifth Sunday in December of that year, but it was presumed that they would be celebrating on New Year's Eve instead. This year, of course, there would be considerably less reason to celebrate, but none of them knew this at the time. The conversation then turned as it normally did to the subject of the peasants. Specifically, the lords complained that the peasants did not respect them the way that they were supposed to, that they had not worked as hard as they could, especially since autumn had been exceptionally mild, and they exchanged ideas about how to remind the peasants what their proper role should be. The general consensus among those gathered was that the lives of the peasants were not quite arduous enough, and, and it was the duty of the noblemen to rectify that particular situation. The Count of Delphia, displaying quite an undue level of compassion towards his peasants, wondered aloud whether the people had enough to eat. Would there be enough grain, he asked rhetorically, to last them through the long winter, which by all indications had conveniently decided to start early that year, until the arrival of spring. What would they eat? The other gentlemen laughed at him scornfully, <laughs> elbowed him in the arm and publicly accused him of being entirely too Peruvian to be of any use as a passionate nobleman. One fair lady then made the absurd suggestion that the peasants may eat cake, which caused quite an outcry among her peers. They warned her with that type of talk, she, much like a character known as Marie Antoinette, would find her neck at the business end of a fallen guillotine, just as soon as someone in their world got around to inventing one. But the Count of Delphia ridiculed this idea in return, partly because if the timeline was analogous, Queen Antoinette would not be born for another 60 years, let alone be sent to said guillotine, but mostly because in whatever alternate historical timeline she may have existed in, she never actually said the ignoble nonsense about the peasants having cake to eat. While the king and his noblemen continued to talk of such important topics as how big of a stick that they should use to beat their serves, and how much better they should treat barn-armed animals than fellow human beings that occupy their kingdom, our Dragonian visitors made their way to the castle gates. After Markardar brought the carriage to a stop and the dragons dismounted, he handed a few round glassy baubles called Zirconia, the standard currency of the realm, to a stately young man in a long black coat, curled white wool wig, and black tricorn hat. Thank you kindly, master, the man said. Then he pocketed the Zirconia and bowed elegantly. Though he tried not to do so, he quickly inspected the dragons and surmised that while the old man and lovely young woman must have been people of some means, he did not much like the appearance of the large barbarian fellow. Yet he said nothing else to them as he climbed into the coach and drove the bourbons to whatever destination the drivers normally took them. Several of the townsfolk eyed their visitors suspiciously as well, 
Taking account of their unusual manner of dresses, they pretended to buy and sell in a marketplace which, on any other day than the dreaded Thursday feast, would be located within the castle gates. Being the blundering, bigoted bastards that they were, they considered Slender's dark skin and her dark hair and not at all dark dress, and thought that she must have been a Mysterionis, the race of people typically held in captivity as slaves. Much the same as their own sordid history, the principal difference between a slave and a free man was the amount of melanin in their skin tone and absolutely bugger all else. But then they considered that Slender was finely dressed, with a far nobler bearing than even the princesses of Case Farage, a half dozen young girls between the ages of 13 and 21 who rode around in a gilded carriage with a folded down top and its own violinist, essentially being nothing more than a menace to the entire city as they rode about. But they held their peace, especially when they saw the size of the leather-bound, dark-skinned, muscular behemoth traveling with them. When Brutodar hoisted that massive steel maul of his that he affectionately referred to as Stick, and slung it over his broad, fur-encased shoulders, the villagers had the good sense to tend to their own affairs. Solyndra looked upon the villagers disdainfully. She reasoned that, in her land, all of the people would be earth dragons like Brutodar, and therefore largely beneath her concern, apart from her royal duty to guide them and protect them from harm. But the dragoness, much like the humans around her, said nothing out loud. Oh, how much her attitude towards humans would change over the next ten years. Pay these humans no mind, Markadar said to Solyndra and Dragonspeak. They are not the ones responsible for what happened to Silfordar. My husband died at the hands of the Centauri, she answered back. I bear humans no ill will, but these do not seem to be the same humans as before. You're thinking of the uh, Gopalonians. They are an entirely different type of humans, far to the south from here. Can we go visit them? Perhaps, if there is time. The dragons turned their attention to the castle gates, except of course for Buddhas, who turned his attention to nothing in particular. And gates, of course, was the proper term, as there were two of them. There was a heavy iron barred portcullis pulled down in front of two dark wooden doors, which could be opened to the inside whenever the wooden pole placed across them was pulled aside. In front of the gate stood two castle guards, or so they were called. Solyndra dressed at the guards, if indeed that was what these creatures were, would be analogous to the fierce red dragons that she had once seen when she accompanied her mother to the second entrance of the catacombs. Her mother, the great priestess queen Jadra, had greeted the guards in Dragonspeak, the telepathic language that Markadar and Solyndra had been using just a little while ago, and calmly walked past them as they stood the ground motionlessly. Princess Sally, as she was known at the time, then followed a few paces behind her mother and tried offering the same greetings to the guards. The red dragons instantly crouched down and menacingly crossed their spears in front of her, her razor sharp tips mere inches from her face. They demanded to know who she was, who her parents were, and what business she had in the sacred grounds of the catacombs. When young Princess Sally could not answer the guards' challenges satisfactorily, they wondered that if she ever so much as thought about approaching the catacombs, they would pierce her heart and cut off her head. Dejected, the young quarter century old whelpling, she would have been seven or eight years old by human standards, ran away screaming in fear. Then she sat on the corner, chucked her head into her knees, and cried bitterly that the daughter of the king would be so unworthy in the eyes of the esteemed wedded dragons. And what of her dear mother, her own daughter might not be able to follow her in the elite ranks of the Golden Dragon Order. Over the years, as my dear reader shall read about in later episodes, she learned to hold the red dragons in very high regard, and began to have much more confidence in herself when she was challenged by the guards. But she never forgot the severity of the guards' actions that day at the entrance of the catacombs. Yes, she beamed with pride that day, 75 years later, when her brothers Arkadar and Soldar first wore their blood-red robes at the graduation day. They, likewise, were quite proud of their sister and her sparkling blue dress. A new sky dragoness had just taken flight. Since there was no way these humans could ever be worthy of the honor of being compared to the illustrious red dragons, she spared absolutely no pity for them at all. The guards in question were fat, lazy bastards who did not even know the proper definition of the word exercise. They were positively bursting out of their black wool shirts, 
over which they miraculously strapped on a set of tight-fitting brass breastplates. Their black wool breeches were only haphazardly tucked into the black leather boots and poorly tied leg guards, neither of which had seen a can of polish since last uncle's passing, and possibly not even before that. Solyndra and Markadar both wondered if they could even see their boots underneath their overextended stomachs. They were armed, as it were, but the long pole axes were far out of immediate reach, leaning against the side of the castle walls. The Dragonian visitors were largely ignored as they approached the castle guards, who were embroiled in a heated discussion. Incidentally, said the punching one to his fellow guard, there is quite the difference between parody and satire. Is there now? The slightly pudgier one said. I thought they were much the same, what with both being forced of comedy and whatnot. The one on the right lighted the match and set fire to a certain dried plant in the bowl of his pipe. See here, parody is simply a humorous take on pre-existing literature or song or some other such nonsense, say an acting troupe were to perform a silly version of a popular story. The one on the left, busy munching on a slab of meat which he procured from somewhere, nobody rightly knows where, replied to the other, But is satire not the same as that and all? Oh, heavens no. Satire, you see, need not even be humorous at all, at least not subject, at least not subject, at least not subjectable, at least not according to someone's point of view. See here, it is more concerns a political or sociable problem that the author want to make right. The slightly taller of the two swallowed the bite of meat and said, So supposing that this here story of ours is satire rather than parody, then what be the political or sociable problem that the author wanted to make right? The ever so slightly more intelligent guard slowly exhaled his pipe smoke pensively. He then shook his head, the jelly under his chin swaying to and fro. Don't say as I rightly know. Ain't read that far enough in the book. Oh, hello there, sirs. The guards finally turned their attentions to the visitors, two of which were patiently awaiting a break in the most ridiculous conversation that they had ever heard, and the third spellbound by such a fascinating and intellectual lesson. Markadar lightly tilted the brim of his hat and stated, We must get through this gate. We have an important message to deliver to your king. Can't say that we allow that, General Sir, the guard with the pipe revealed, somehow recognizing the rank. Three inch high white seven pointed stars all in a row were displayed across the upper left side of Markadar's chest, or perhaps he just got lucky. Then he added, What with the Thursday feast and all? Dododar perked up as he heard a word that he actually knew. Feast? Merciful me, explained the one with the meat. That Todd damn fellow's bigger than we are. The one on the right leaned heavily against the portcullis, as he was absolutely exhausted from all that standing around and talking. The thick iron bars in response squeaked loudly under the heavy strain. Yes, sir, so when Madden too, of course. This here be the time for the Thursday piece. Nobility and royalty only pass this point. Markadar was rapidly losing his temper, but Slendra reassured him silently through dragon speak. Then she calmly walked up to the guards and smiled at them sweetly, working with the suspicion that these two men were much in want of feminine attention. Such strong guards, she said, resting them by the shoulders, bravely putting their lives on the line to protect the castle. We are, madam. Very much so, said the other. Slinger then moved her hand to grab their breastplates. Such thick metal armor. It must be difficult to carry such heavy armor everywhere you go. It is, madam, said the one. Very much so, said the other, who just now remembered to take another bite of his meat. Solyndra then clenched her jaws and lowered her gaze. Her eyes flashed a bright blue color which caused the guards to cast worried glances at one another. After all, the fact that the real live woman was actually touching them would have aroused a great deal of suspension, and they did not like the look in her eyes at all. Solyndra then cast bolts of lightning through her palms into the guards' breastplates, causing the men to perform a traditional tribal dance that electricians and technicians the world over refer to as the 60 Hertz Shuffle. Two of the characters featured in this chapter quickly lost control of their bodily fluids, and the stench wafting into Slender's nostrils told her that it did not come from the dragons. Slender leaned down to address the barely conscious smoldering mass of what, moments before, had passed as castle guards. She then growled through her clenched teeth, I am royalty. 
She then stood upright and took the liberty to kick the pipe smoker in the ribs, an action which caused him to moan weakly in response. Markadar then placed a hand on her shoulder in an effort to calm her, and received a residual shock for his efforts. But that at least got her attention, and she whipped around gaily, as if she were oblivious to the fact that she had just severely shocked two castle guards. Well, that was fun, she announced, and then turned her attention back to the guards, who were still squirming on the ground and moaning in pain. Run away! Needing no further impetus for action, the guards rolled themselves until they somehow brought themselves to their feet and started waddling away as fast as their feet could carry them. Not remotely satisfied, Cylindra produced another spark with her hand and hurled another lightning bolt towards the slightly slower of the two. The bolt hit him square in the arse, which spurred them forward with the tidiest modicum of speed, at least for a few seconds. Markadar chortled at the sight of the humans who were still attempting to run away from the castle, then turned back around to the castle gates. After mumbling something to the effect that there were no other castle guards around to challenge them, he then began to consider how they were going to open the castle gates. At the present moment, Brutodar had picked up one of the pole axes with his left hand and was weighing it against the mall in his right hand. After carefully weighing the two, he carelessly tossed the pole axe to the side. The wooden handle hit the wall of the castle with such force that the weapon splintered into thousands of tiny pieces and a large chunk of the stone wall crumpled to the ground. He then heaved them all back onto his shoulder, pleased with his choice. Markadar paused briefly, but seeing no other castle guards, he asked Brutodar to open the gate. With a loud cracking sound, the dragon man slammed his hammer down to the ground and then grabbed the iron bars of the portcullis. Growling fiercely, his long, sharp yellow fangs protruding down from his supper lips, he pulled up the gate with all his might until the pointed shafts at the bottom were well above his head. He briefly let go of the gate just to see what would happen and the gate fell down in place with great force and incredible noise. Assuming that a thunderous sound such as that should have woken the neighbors, causing them to shake their fists and warn the dragons to turn down their stereo systems, or at least listen to a more sensible style of music, the dragons stood silently and waited for any sign of life. The townsfolk, meanwhile, halted any pretense of ignoring the dragons and began to approach them. Surely, they seemed to think, a giant beast of a man who can lift the heavy iron portcullis with his bare hands is infinitely more exciting than the normal task of buying and selling baked goods and clothing and freshly caught fish and household utensils and nearly worthless trinkets crafted by the somewhat less industrious ones who had no items to sell in those other categories. And the author, with his penchant for long and unnecessarily complicated sentences, was quite pleased that the word AND was repeated enough times in the preceding sentence. And literally Genesis producer Paul C. Hartley counted to ten, calmed himself down, and gratefully decided not to sue the author for plagiarism. And Samathisa Gigglewillow readied her oversized wooden mallet for action. And the reader wanted the author to quit dawdling and get to the exciting part. From behind the dragons, a great clamor arose from the crowd of villagers. With a flurry of activity, the men started to place bets with each other over the next exciting feat the visitors would perform. One said that the large smelly wood would lift the portacle so high that it would get stuck in place. Another bet that more highly trained guards, or perhaps even the elite guard knights, would draw their weapons and prepare to fight. But another wagered that the guard knights would take a single look at the big guy and run away in fright, much like the fat ones had. Still another speculated that the visitors would be led to the castle without further delay. Yet one more man guessed that the message the tall one was delivered to the king would have a devastating effect on all their lives. They were all correct. This is how it happened. That concludes this segment of Slender Dragon Eye, a novel perspective of the psychology of warfare. In the next edition, a castle guard pisses all over himself. No, oh, wait, no he doesn't. Find out for certain in the next edition. If you wish to support me in my work, please purchase the original book from Amazon Kindle from the link in the description box. And for the more adventurous sods among you who wish to view more of my wonderful work, feel free to hit the subscribe button.